Well, good morning. Hope everybody's doing all right. It is cold again. So this is um, the result of Janet Sunderman. Um, she has jinxed us. Uh, she opened her pool too early. And so God is saying, I've got through with the coldness yet. <clears throat> and he's trying to teach her a lesson, but nonetheless, there, there you go. Um, yeah, it, I, today's sermon is called 10 Years and Counting. Um, I, I have been here 10 years. Uh, 10 years ago on April 27th was when I preached my second sermon here at the church. And then the church voted. There were 45 people. And one of them voted no, and I've been looking for that person ever since. <laughs> Haven't quite figured out who that is, but I'm still looking for that, that one individual that voted no. But um, it, it, has been, it has been quite, quite the experience here. Um, and I honestly, if I, I, was, I was thinking, I slowed down a little bit the last two weeks and just started reflecting back on, on 10 years and everything that we've done and some crazy stuff that has happened, not because it's crazy in a negative way, but because there's some things that really shouldn't have been done, but were done and worked. Um, and, and thinking back, and I, even if I tried to write a book about how we got here, I couldn't do it. And, and I think the reason for that is that God is a very mysterious God, and he, he has always been at work in this church. And we have always tried to focus on him and go in his direction and do what he wanted us to do and live like he's wanting us to live. And if there's any secret to church and the feeling that you get when you're here, it's, it's the secret of really focusing on Jesus really works. It, it just really works. So we really, so far, and I don't know what the next 10 years is going to bring. I, I can't see that far ahead, but so far, we, our politics is almost non-existent. Um, we uh, work together as a team to reach the community. We have seen many people come to know the Lord. We have, we have touched many lives. Um, there have been people that we have trained and have gone out to other churches to help other churches, and it, it's, just, it's just been, it's just been um, absolutely, absolutely incredible. Um, so as I was reflecting, I, I actually came up with this, this message I'm going to give you today, and um, I want to read you this verse before we go to our main text today, and this is, this is from Acts 20. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to just read it to you. We'll get there later, but here it is. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says this, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. If, if I was to go to any verse that I go to from time to time just to remind me of what I'm supposed to be doing, it's this verse right here. God has entrusted me with a group of people, and it says right here that I'm supposed to be careful attention to myself. In other words, I've got to live right. It saddens my heart when I see pastors fall. It, it, it breaks my heart. But at the same time, I, I know exactly how that happens. I know exactly how that happens. Temptation comes, and if you're not carefully watching yourself, you will go in that direction and you will fall. So you you. I have to take careful attention to myself and to all the flock. In other words, watch, watch over them, where they're going, what they're doing, kind of try to stay connected. Um, I really can't think of a person in this church I don't like. Well, maybe Jimmy. But I, there's, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Jimmy, Jimmy and I are good friends. But, but I can't think of a person that I don't like. I can't think um, of, of people I don't care for in this church. I just, I just can't. And I think that's, that's of God. So you watch after that. And then the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So my caring is not even as close to what God cares for you. 
He shed his own, only his blood for you because he loved you so much. And there's a reason for that. So I want you to take, I want to take, I, I can't even talk it now. I'm kind of fighting an emotion and at the same time trying to speak. So turning your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. By the way, while you're turning there, um, I did peek into this bag because uh, <laughs> this was sticking out. This, <laughs> I don't know who figured this out. I kind of have an object, but, but this, this is a book. This is a record called Disco Mickey Mouse. I had this when I was a kid, and, and I lost it. And uh, back, back um, I, don't, I think it was 2004, we went to... Um, Disney for the first time. I think that was it. I was looking for this record so that we could, I could make a tape or a CD out of it, really, a CD, so I could play it for the kids as we went on the trip, and I couldn't find it because my mom had sold it um, in a yard sale for 50 cent. Um, this is worth a lot more than 50 cent, uh, this little record here. So whoever thought of this and whatever group, this, this was, that, that's nice, little record right there. So yeah, so there you go. All right. I didn't look at it to see if it had scratches. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay, John chapter 10, verse 1, it says this. Truly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by the name that leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know his, the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. If I was, as, as I have a personal vision for every message that I preach, it is this. I want to present the truth of God in such a way that I push you toward the abundant life in Christ. When I am sitting at, in studying for a sermon, there is a lot of stuff that goes on the cutting room floor because I don't think it's going to push the congregation on that day toward the life of Christ, toward the abundant life of Christ. I have a deep conviction that everywhere, most places, and I'm not, I'm not being critical, I'm just saying I have a deep conviction that the church doesn't often do a good job at pushing people toward the life of Christ. We push ourselves toward something else, something that we think is life that isn't life. A lot of churches, a lot of churches and places want to... It, push toward a different a, a style, they want to push toward this, they want to push toward that, but the thing that they are missing is we are called to push people as under shepherds toward the life of Christ. In verse 10, it says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus wanted us, you and I, to experience life in this world that is abundant, real, and awesome. That is why he came. That is, that is what he was pushing you toward. And I feel like his vision should also be my vision in pushing you towards that life. So what is the first, first step in, in getting abundant life, this life that Jesus wants you to have? Well, verse 9 says this, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. First of all, you can't have the abundant life if you're not a Christian. You can't have it. You can't tap into it. You can't experience it. You can't go for it. 
But Jesus Christ came, and this text will also tell you that he laid down his life for the world. He shed his blood for the world. And then he rose the third day so that anyone who would believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be saved and have that abundant life. It is nothing that you do. It's nothing that, that you, 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 know, you have to do in order to get it. All it is is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him forgiveness from your sins, for your, for your sins, and he comes inside of you and gives you that life. So the gospel is essential to everything you do in the church. I know you, I know you hear it a lot. But there's some people in this room that have never taken the first step toward abundant life. They have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They've never had the moment where they felt guilty of their sins and pled the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and asked them into their heart to be a part of their life, to take control. And they're floundering through life trying to do this, trying to do that, trying to find life here, trying to find life there, and they can never get to it because they've never taken the initial step. So we, we push people toward the life that is in the Lord Jesus because everything else in this world is death. Everything else in this world is death. If you pursue this, it's death. But if you pursue Jesus, it's abundant life. If you per- pursue this over here, it's death. But if you, per- if you pursue Jesus, it's abundant life. Salvation is the key to that. Here's how Jesus puts it. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. See, at the point that you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, death is just a door into eternal life with God. The moment that you do that, death is actually victory for the Christian. You die, and immediately you overcome everything that you've struggled with this entire life. Death is an amazing, amazing thing. Um, if I ever die, which I will, I want to be buried before you have the service. I want you to go to, the, go to the graveside, put me in the ground, cover the dirt on top of me, and then come here and have the service, and at the end of that, celebrate life. I do not want your last view of me being going into the earth. I want your last view to be of Jesus Christ and where I'm at. You tracking with me? Death is not the end for me. I am now in heaven praising God, so why don't you just put me in the dirt? You can burn me for it. You can throw me in in a gully that Roger has, for all I care, for his cows to look at. I I could care less what you do with my body because I'm not here. So come back and with me in heaven, worship God and the life that he has given all of us. See, resurrection, if, even if he dies, he will live. Here's the next thing. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yesterday. I, bless their hearts. The Jehovah's Witness rang my doorbell. They rang my doorbell. Um, and, and it was a lady. She was 72 years old. She had, she had been a Jehovah's Witness longer than I've been born. She, it, was, it was crazy. And then there was this other lady that was in her 60s, and she was, has been a part of it about the same amount of time. It was, it was amazing. And I, I talked to them a little bit, and I have, I have kind of changed the way I witness to them. I no longer argue with them. I talk to them about their family. I look for an open door to tell them that my Jesus is different than theirs, but I do it in a very loving way. So yesterday, we, we were talking, I, I found out about her kids, I found out how many years they had lived in our neighborhood, I talked to them a little bit, and this lady right here, um, I, I forget her name now, she told me, but you know, sometimes you don't remember names, but so here's this lady, and she, she said, um, well, there's a misconception with Jehovah's Witnesses, that um, 
that we don't believe that you have to accept Jesus in order to go to heaven. We believe that you have to accept Jesus to, to go into heaven. This is right after I told her that I was a Baptist pastor, so I think she was trying to do that sort of thing. And then I looked at her and said, now look, we can have a theological discussion that would probably turn into an argument and neither one of us would change. But this is something that you and I can agree on as you leave. Your Jesus that you accepted is different than the Jesus I accepted. You would try to convince me that your Jesus is the real Jesus, and I would tell you that the real Jesus is the one that I've accepted into my heart. And she said, fair enough. I then proceeded to talk to them about what they had talked to me about because they don't agree with Islam and they don't agree with, um, with, uh, <laughs> with the Mormons. And so I said, and a common ground that we all have is this. We don't believe the Jesus of Islam is the true Jesus, and we don't believe that the Mormon Jesus is the true Jesus. And if you were to say right now you don't believe the Baptist is the true Jesus, and, and I don't believe that you have the true Jesus. So the struggle that you are going to have that I will not have is if your Jesus is the right one, because I guarantee you, though you know a lot about the Bible, you don't have a relationship with him. And if you search your heart, you will know this to be true. You know what they said to me? We have never met a pastor like you in all the years that we've been going door to door. Okay? I'm not sure what that means, but that's good. Okay? I don't know what that means. And she, she said for the first time, she had seen the love of Christ from our perspective going to her because the doors that she rings all the time are mad at them and argue. Are you with me? And before I came to this church, I made a decision about all that. It is not my job to argue the truth. It is my job to proclaim the truth in a loving way. I don't have to convince somebody of the truth. That is not my job. You know whose job that is? The Holy Spirit of God. And at the end of the day, he does a better job. Come on. He does a better job. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to heaven. He is God in the flesh, the perfect lamb that shed his blood for you and me so that we might spend an eternity with him in heaven. And that is the first step toward abundant life. Amen? All right. Now, here's a, here's a Christian artist. Her name is Blanca, I think. I want to say Blanca, but it's Blanca. Here's, here's, here's her picture. Now, um, Ben Miller probably doesn't listen to her music. Um, this is more of a, a popish sort of, you know, kind of Philip Brand music. So she was, she was talking, she was giving a testimony one day, and, and um, she had walked into the living room where her, her, uh, her husband was, and her husband said, um, Honey, did, did you purchase $3,000 worth of floor tile? And Blanca looked at him and said, Honey, look at this face. Does this even look like I know where to buy tile? Right? So here is a, a case of what? Identity theft, right? I got a call um, two years ago, and I was, I was on the phone with, with Chase. That's who I have my credit card with. And I was on the phone with them, and they said, Philip, um, did you purchase a Windows computer No. Listen, there are two computers in this world. Dead in Christ computers, which is Windows machines, and salvation computers, which is Apple. 
So, so they said that on the phone, and somebody had used our card to buy a computer for like $1,800, and so they took care of all that. I don't know how they took care of it, but we didn't have to pay that. But nonetheless, it was definitely something that, that did not strike up my identity, right? So Balak is saying she doesn't have the face, and I'm saying there's no way that I would have a Windows computer. I mean, I don't mind if you have one, but you could have life a lot easier. Listen, Apple is the idiot computer. It, it really is. But nonetheless, that's a different thing. It is not my identity to have one of those. If I strolled in here and put, put a Dell computer here and started using it, there are some of you that would say, what is that? Why does he have that? Right? Because you know me. You know that things attach to my identity. Here in this passage of Scripture, it says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, there are some things that should not be your identity. There are some things that used to be your identity before you received Christ that you should not bring with you with this abundant life. There are a lot of people that don't live like a Christian, but then say that they're a Christian. They do things that you're like, that does not fit the identity of Christ. If you and I are to live the Christian life and go toward this life, we have to live it in such a way that if Jesus wouldn't do it, we shouldn't do it. Come on. Because there's some things that you and I do, and I'm using you and I do, that Je Jesus, he, 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 he wouldn't do that. Come on. He, he wouldn't do that, right? So the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy to take you away from that abundant life, but Jesus Christ wants you to do things that matches the identity of the life that he died for you to have. Um, I used to mow, mow yards, and, and a guy I worked for had a son, and for Christmas, he asked for a bad fire truck, a bad guy fire truck. And so I said, well, well, what is a bad guy fire truck? Oh, Philip, oh, it's a fire truck that when you pull up to the house and it's on fire, it, it flame throws fire on top of that fire and just takes care of the house. If your house was burning and, a, and the Farmington Fire Department pulled up with the fire truck and flames started shooting out of the hose, what would you think? Fire should never be a part of the identity of what's coming out of that hose. It should be water, right? It should be water. Many of us live our lives as bad boy fire trucks. We roll, roll around saying that we're Christian, but when we turn on the hose, we're shooting fire and destruction everywhere that we point it. If you know of a Christian that every time they open their mouth, they're trying to destroy somebody or they're trying to talk down about somebody or they're trying to say something bad about the church, that is a Christian that is a bad boy fire truck that's just trying to burn it all down. Come on. It is not life. You and I are to be fire trucks for God that shoot the life-giving water onto the culture, something positive onto the culture not constantly trying to burn things down with our criticisms. Come on. It is one thing to recognize what is wrong. It's another thing to criticize people for it. And the moment that we step across and start criticizing people for it and looking down on them is the moment that we've grabbed that identity that is not a part of Christ, but is a part of a different, something totally different that isn't life. We are called to give encouragement and water and stand for truth and put out the destructive forces in this world, not add to them.
Come on. Come on. And look, I have a list of people sometimes I'd like to take out. Right? But I can't roll up in my bad boy fire truck and, and do my fire thing. Can't do that. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Let's say 2029. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified." See, you, you cannot build up a church unless you're focused on Jesus and not tearing things down. Come on. Cannot do that. And so we push people toward life. Turn your Bible to 1 Thessalonians. It's just right to your right. 1 Thessalonians. Need to move a little... First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, um, chapter five, and listen to verse uh, verses twelve and following. Of course, I just had Thessalonians. There it is, five. Yeah, verse twelve. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work, be at peace among yourself. Be at peace among yourselves. Verse 14, and we urge you, brothers, admonishing the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. That is what we should be living. Peace among yourselves admonishing the people who are idle, encouraging the faint-hearted, helping the weak, being patient with them all. That pushes people toward Christ. That is what that does. So, let's move on. Back to John, chapter 10. Look at verse 16. It says this. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, And I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jump over to verse 27. It says this, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. What does that say? My my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. That is Jesus talking. My sheep hear my voice. You know the key to staying into abundant life is hearing Jesus' voice? Did you know that? Being quiet enough to hear him speak to you? That is the key? You might say, wait a minute. 
I'm not so sure that, that God speaks with his voice today. Well, he, he does. And there's plenty of scripture to tell you that. God speaks to his people. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. It gives us a warning. It says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In other words, if Jesus speaks to you today, ladies and gentlemen, and he's pushing you toward life, you need to hear his voice and do what he says, and do not harden your hearts. Here's a couple of ways that people harden their hearts. First is with theological discussions. I am all for biblical doctrine. I'm all for knowing what the Bible says. But when it comes to theological systems and stuff and people get into arguments, that is the moment in time that people quit listening to Jesus because they're trying to prove their point and not promote his. Come on. So to, to push Jesus is to know doctrine, but it's not to hold so tightly to a theological, a systematic theology that that's all you talk about. Theology is really lighthearted conversation because if you go deep with the Bible, you are going into how it really relates to your life and how to live it. I can come up with a theological outline within 10 to 5 minutes. And yes, I said 10 to 5 because I'm left-brained and that's just the way I think. Okay? 10 to 5 minutes, I can do that. But to actually come up with something that relates to people's lives and application-wise takes a long time to do because you have to think about it and you have to go deeper and you have to take this concept and figure out how it works out in this life. Here's another thing that often it cancels out God's voice. It's activity. It's activity. There are so many activities outside of the church that you and I can be a part of, and it seems like people do this when they're really supposed to be studying scripture at church. So there's all this stuff going on and and God has this, you need to be with me, but there's a pull this way and there's activities going on with all of this. Education has a different voice than God has. We We have taken anything biblical out of the schools, and I'm not preaching on that, but to re replace it, we've replaced it with a humanistic religion. You, you cannot teach without teaching some form of religion that you hold dear. And if you believe in evolution, that takes the faith that is greater than mine. Because it really doesn't make sense if you really think about it. So educational, what they're telling us, uh, telling our kids about this and the environment and all this kind of stuff is just, is just voices that cancel out his voice. Entertainment. Entertainment cancels out Jesus' voice. There's, there's entertainment that is just not godly. And when we saturate our lives with that type of entertainment, it is harder for us to hear Jesus' voice. And he's speaking to you. If you are a believer, he's speaking to you. But you can get deaf to it. Political. Being politically correct can dampen out Jesus' voice. This is why a lot of political correctness is just stupid. It just is. We get so upset about race this and race that and this is a Hitler and this is not a... It's just absolutely ridiculous. Cancel that stuff out and you might be able to hear the voice of Jesus who died for all the nations and probably laughs at all of them in a comical, loving way. I know he laughs at this white boy from time to time. What is he doing? (laughs) Yeah. Cultural voices. All of those deafen the voice of God. So here's the question for you this morning. Do you know his voice? Do you know what his voice sounds like? Do you know when Jesus is really talking to you and it's not something else? Or are you so distracted you don't have time to listen to him because you're listening to all these other voices in your life? If you are listening to all those other voices in your life, you are not going toward life in Jesus. You're just not. You know, I have found that when, when Jesus talks to me, I do not get to choose the subject.
Lord, please speak to me today. I'm really having a trouble here. I, I really need some wisdom in handling this. Oh, no, he wants to talk about this over here. But no, 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 I really need wisdom. No, 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 you don't get to choose the subject. Here's the second thing about Jesus' voice. He will never force you to do what he has spoken into your soul. He will never force you to do it. Never will. Um, I was a youth pastor back in the day. I'm not going to tell you when, but I was a youth pastor. And um, we went to camp, and um, there, was this, there, was this, there was this boy that was in the group that got into a fight with another boy from another group, and this boy was in my group. Well, he wanted to go home. I mean, he, he, he won because I only, I only have winners in my group. So, so he won, and so I, they, they came to me. They told me about it. I set the boy down and, and was talking to him. It was, it was a tuck. And um, I was talking to him, and I said, well, well what, why did you do this? He said, well, he'd, he'd been picking on me and pushing me around um, all week long, and it is now Wednesday, and I was just tired of it. I said, no, 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 no. Um, tell me what made you snap. He said, well, he made fun of my mom, and he told me, told me what was said. I said, okay. Okay, now deep inside, as a pastor, you're thinking, I think I would have hit him too if that had been said to me, but this is not good. This is Christian camping. We're not supposed to be violent. We're not supposed to be like a, a bad boy fire truck with fire, right? Not supposed to be that. So this kid wanted to go home. He just wanted to go home. And so I kept, I kept telling him, why do you want to go home? Well, because, because I just don't want to apologize to this other kid for beating them up, for hitting them. I just don't want to apologize. So he had that going on inside of him. So we sat there a moment, and I said, so, almost said his name. Um, Bob, I'll just say Bob. Bob, what is God telling you in your heart? He said, well, he's telling me to, to ask forgiveness. I said, Okay. So let's not harden our heart against that, and let's, let's just go up and, and just apologize. It's just an apology. No, I just would rather go home. I'm just not going to do that. So, okay, well, let's go to the office. I can call your parents. They will come. They'll pick you up, and, and that will be fine. But I really wish that you would respond to the voice of God in your heart and that you would actually, you know, go and apologize. Well, we were walking um, to the office, and his camp counselor came out. I don't, I don't, came out, just was there. And he said, Bob, um, hey, are, you, are you going home? And uh, he said, yeah, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home. And uh, the camp counselor said, you know what? Before you go home, I think you need to apologize to that kid that you hit, that you beat up. And you know what the kid said? Okay. And he went with him and apologized and stayed the rest of the week. And that shows you how much leadership influence I have. <laughs> you know what's key about that? Sometimes we just need somebody that's outside of the conversation just to say what God has been saying in our heart so that it would resonate enough for us to do it. See, God talks to your soul. Jesus talks to your soul. You have to know what his voice is. And then you hear something else and it resonates inside of you and then you're able to take care of whatever you're supposed to take care of. That is how God works. God wants you to listen to his voice and not harden your heart against it. If you harden your heart, it's death. But he will never force you to do what he is speaking into your soul. He will just encourage you and push you toward it because Jesus is all about pushing you toward abundant life. Abundant life. This verse says this. 
For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. In other words, when you open the scripture and you are reading it, if your heart feels something, God is speaking to you. If you can just open the scriptures and not feel anything in the depths of your soul, in your heart, you have lost the ability to listen to what Jesus is trying to tell you. Jesus is always trying to communicate, and he does it when you meditate on his word. He will tell you the right thing to do. You cannot just go through this life and never meditate on Scripture or just hear messages on Sunday morning and expect to be able to distinguish Jesus' voice from all the other voices in the world. You have to remain submersed in His Word, meditating in His Word, listening to His Word, letting that Word cut you to the heart, to the soul, in order for you to actually know what His voice sounds like. But the thief has come to the church and the thief has come to Christians and the thief has come to the sheep. And he has convinced us that we can go our entire week doing all these other important things that have our attention without doing the most important thing, which is spending time with the Lord Jesus Christ and listening for him to speak to us. The reason that we can't get grab a hold of that abundant life sometimes is because we are so busy grabbing onto death in other places in the world, and the life is in the Scripture, and the life is in Jesus, and the life is in Holy Spirit, and that is what you submerge yourself into and listen to on a daily basis so that you and I both know what Jesus' voice truly sounds like. Are you with me this morning, church? The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And if when you read the scriptures, it is not active in your soul, you have forgotten what the good shepherd's voice sounds like. Man. Um. I was just talking to someone out in the lobby, and, and they've, they've started really studying Scripture. And uh, what struck me about that conversation is when he was talking to me, he said, the more I get into it, the more I study Scripture, the more I kind of back away and kind of become a little bit more careful with how I'm living. I'm a little concerned that I really don't match up to what the Scripture says. You know what that tells me? tells me that Jesus has been speaking to his heart. Because the scripture is both challenging and encouraging. It leads us to life and not death. And it's really what we center our life upon. Amen? So, life. Life. Pushing you toward life. And I'll be honest, because I've listened to them. Sometimes I like that sermon on that Sunday, and sometimes I wonder, oh my goodness, I don't even know if anything (laughs) was straight or this way or that way. But as long as we as a whole church focus on going after the life in Christ that he has given to us, the more we do that, the more he will show up here in services, the more he will speak to us in these services, and there are only greater things ahead for this church in the future as we seek him. Let's pray.